Easy peasy. Um, thanks, you know, everyone for coming. <laughs> More people. Okay, anyway. Um, my name is Ali. Uh, I'm part of the Flat Acres Affiliated Society. Um, as I said, so we are an educational organization con devoted to a historical understanding of the left and Marxism. Um, and it was, we were established in December 2006 in Chicago and focused on the problems and tasks inherited from the old, the 1920s and 30s left, the new left, the 1960s and 70s, and the post-political left of the 1980s and 90s for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. So we are in reading groups, we have panels, which we have one in Melbourne on the 2nd of December on imperialism. I'll post a link for that soon. Um, we also have the publication, as I said. Um, we also run some informal coffee breaks just to have discussions about current events and the sorts. Uh, so yeah, feel free to take any of the PRs and start. Um, I'll just start it, why not? Before I start, if any of you have any questions, you know, clarifications, if you need something to, to, to ask me, just please do during my talk. I'll be speaking for like 15 minutes to an hour. So just ask that and I'll, I'll, I will respond. Um, there will be a more extensive Q&A at the end of the talk. So, the purpose of this teaching is to pose the problem of the relationship and perhaps tensions of Marxism to philosophy. More broadly, I aim to investigate how Karl Marx's philosophical predecessors and contemporaries, in particular, if you've heard those of the Ger school of German idealism and materialism, influence his critical theory. Um, today, I will try as much as I can in an hour or 50 minutes a broad overview of what the states of philosophy were. Um, and I'll also be focusing on Karl Kohl, whom some of you may have heard. He was writing in 1923 about the crisis of Marxism and he was articulating what Marxism meant for philosophy. Um, so I would begin by raising some questions for everyone here, to just to guide this teaching. You know, what is the task of philosophy in regards to social transformation? Does it have one? If Marxism does have a relation to social transformability, how is philosophy related? Um, like I said, I think we'll just keep it a bit informal. Very briefly, there's three sections in my main talk. Again, feel free to ask questions. There's motivation to study philosophy, foundations for Marxism, revolutionary theory and practice, and like a concluding section, which is Marxism in crisis. Before I start, does anyone want to raise any points or ask any questions? If not, easy peasy. First section, motivation to study philosophy, bourgeois philosophy. So why did Marx study philosophy? And maybe why should we? I think Marx's motivation to study philosophy is not just, you know, as we te technically see it, as understanding reality, social relations, society, but what philosophy meant for social transformability and how relevant it is for changing social relations. Really, for Marx, philosophy poses these questions of truly understanding, but also changing reality um, as a critical philosophy. His motivations can also be summed up in one of his most famous phrases, um, which was a letter to his friend Arnold Ruger in 1848, 1844, um, he, where he calls for ruthless criticism of everything existing. The need to articulate this in 1844 will be discussed in a later section, while this section focuses on Marx's understanding of philosophy in general. Um, the core foundation of Marx's understanding of the task to study philosophy and a ruthless critique is, of course, not something novel. Uh, it originates from his predecessors, like Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, and just a question, have you guys heard of Rousseau, Kant, and Hegel before? Woo! Woo. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> so, yeah, th these ideas are not novel to Marx, but these philosophers are all part of what is known as the Enlightenment era. And they characterize a new paradigm of philosophy, what we may name as bourgeois philosophy. Now, before delving into what bourgeois philosophy is, it's important to note that bourgeois philosophy only emerges as society becomes bourgeois. Now, the term bourgeois, some of you have heard of it, but bourgeois in the French origin literally means city man. Um, and so bourgeois society emerges as a new qualitative shift in social relations after feudal society. To be bourgeois is not to be a member of the bourgeoisie, Rather, it refers to certain social relations after 
feudal society defined, which feudal society was defined by strict hierarchies such as the serfs and the nobility. To be bourgeois is not to be, um, it refers to these social relations that are also based on labor and free exchange. Um, they also emerge with these new cities that are free, that everyone has, can exchange their own labor to any producer or any employer and get wages to be able to prosper. This was a very key characteristic of these sort of bourgeois social relations. Uh, and they were very typical in Europe, but also spreading across all the world. Therefore, bourgeois philosophy emerges as the articulation of the development of these free cities and of course the task of freedom. Now, before I get into freedom, what distinguishes ancient philosophy before the early Enlightenment, around you know, early 17th century, from bourgeois philosophy is that the latter could take upon itself the meaning of freedom as a historical task, but also as a specific historical task to transform society. Uh, for example, you know, the philosophy of Plato, who we are very familiar with, only sought a sort of a closed form of society, governed by strict morals, strict divisions. Whereas Kant imagined a society of freedom and little political limitations for people to pursue what they want. Um, freedom is a word, you know, we've all come across. Ah, oh, yes, question. Yes, please. <laughs> Yes, yeah, certainly I think, you know, to say that, you know, these bourgeois philosophers just created these ideas out of nothing is, is a wrong thing. So what I'm saying is that you're historical, yeah, yes. like, we have examples of people thinking about these things and talking about these things, despite not being in a bourgeois mm. Well, so the, the, the thing that I would say is that if you actually look at the sort of historical track of enlightenment thinkers, it's funny, you, you start with people like um, John Locke and... Um, Hobbes, mm. who they they don't have this kind of uh, like liberal philosophy that, that true bourgeois philosophers later have. It's actually much more materialistic. Actually, that way to put it, but it's, mu it's, mu it's a much more mechanical ideology because these people are sort of in the in the, the birthing pains of the bourgeois society from feudalism. So their ideas of difference. Uh, what I think you can say is that. Um, I think we can distinguish a little bit between the Enlightenment philosophers who are in that period, like Hobbes and Locke, who are concerned with creating it, and then the later Enlightenment sure, philosophers who are about the okay, post hoc justification. Of and, like, if we're talking about freedom in terms of like people being able to create themselves, we have examples of people like thinking about those things prior to the emergence of uh, even you know proto bourgeois society in Europe. Mm. Um, one, one key characteristic. Mm. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I think one key characteristic of bourgeois philosophy that is, I, th I would say, different from these indigenous thinkers who I have to say I haven't read much of them, so maybe I should read some. Mm -hmm. But one thing that is particular is particularly that it emerges in cities, in these urban centers, yep. and that the, in, in these urban centers, you would have um, this, these, uh, the social relations were based on this form of uh, labor and free exchange. Like I said, I, for example, I could go to any producer, or any employer, and exchange my sort of labor for wages that I could prosper. These were certain key characteristics that was that these bourgeois philosophers were writing about. Um, one text that I would recommend uh, interest is interesting by Kant. What is um, the, a cosmopolitan view? A, a, a universal history of the cosmopolitan point of view is a very interesting um, text that I would recommend everyone to read. And it talks about how bourgeois society emerges. That our freedom as individuals really achieves, becomes into fruition as society starts becoming bourgeois because of these new bourgeois social relations. Um, and I th we can talk about these bourgeois social relations, I think, later across this. Um, but as I said, you know, freedom we've come across at various times, there's various conceptions of freedom, and they're all valid. And what 
I guess, bourgeois philosophy again adds to this certain notion of freedom is that people can not only thrive and prosper, but they can also pursue what they want without any previous historical antecedent. I'll provide a quote by Marx. The absolute working out of his creative potentialities with no presupposition other than previous historical development, which makes this totality, totality meaning all, of development, i.e. the development of all human powers as such, the end in itself, not as measured by on any predetermined yardstick. So we already talked about how you know the, the sort of task of freedom and bourgeois philosophy really emerges as society and individuals start becoming bourgeois in these particular cities as they are becoming more free. Bourgeois philosophy theorizes the historical progress of freedom. And one particular aspect I'll actually be focusing on is the German idealism of Hegel, which I think really brings this into question this concept of freedom and historical progress. Before I get into Hegel, I will just quote one thing from Karl Koch, and he says, the ideologues at the time, by the ideologues he means the, 19, the late 19th century, really after Marx, and that he was critiquing, did not see that the ideas contained in a philosophy can live on not only in philosophies, but equally well in positive sciences and social practice, and that the emergence of critical consciousness, uh, 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 and that this process precisely began on a large scale with Hegel's philosophy. End quote. And so we have the emergence of critical consciousness, the very one that Marx takes on board. This is why Marx is really still part of the tradition of the Enlightenment. He is a bourgeois intellectual thinker. That is to say, he is aware and inspired by these revolutionary tasks that bourgeois philosophy has played in transforming both thought and society. Bourgeois, bourgeois philosophy had made the world philosophical, that is, reality philosophical, meaning how we thought about society had a radical bearing on how it could change. Of course, you know, not always in the most perfect, ideal way we would want it. But Marx continues this task of freedom. But now for him, philosophy must become worldly. You know, therefore the mystery of this term, philosophy must become worldly until the end of the teaching, as I'll try to clarify what that means. Um, just a bit, and also myself, you know, I, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm not as you know, inspired and motivated as Marx was to studying philosophy. I just thought philosophy was cool, you know, questioning life, you know, Socrates, why is everything like this? Um, but the way that Marx understood it, as many of you may find interesting, I think has influenced me of how now I understand what the task of philosophy is and why we may be studying philosophy as a sort of not just understanding, but perhaps changing the world. What Marx was grasping during his lifetime, that is during the 1840s, is the task of philosophy to become, make itself worldly. Um, now I would like to move on to German idealism. But before actually moving on, I just want to provide a bit of setup of why I was prompted to talk about German idealism and materialism. Um, the reason I was prompted to do this was because the distinction between idealism and materialism is what lies at the center of this debate of social transmobility. The different interpretations of spirit, for example, a soul, a god, or a metaphysical entity, as opposed to nature, and by nature I don't mean trees or the environment, I mean material, physical reality, provide different approaches to how we can grasp and change society. You know, whether we uh, believe that the development of pure ideas can change society, or whether our material desires and activity can actually form a fundamental basis for changing society. I quote Engels, those who asserted the primacy of spirit to nature and therefore in the last instance assume world creation in some form or other, compromise the camp of idealism. The others who regarded nature as primary belong to the various schools of materialism. However, idealism and materialism were taken up to be more, you know, distinguishing between achieving ideals of the spirit or the pursuit of material desires. What Engels wants to clarify, first and foremost, is the importance of Hegel's idealism and later on critiquing this form of idealism through materialism, and of course critiquing materialism later on, 
we arrive at Marxism, what Marxism is, and also at the question of what the stakes of philosophy were. Um, when we distinguish between the idealist Hegel and the materialist Marx, the important note is that for both Marx and Hegel, the stakes are still freedom. Again, I quote Hegel, history is progress in the consciousness of freedom. For Marx, any further development must also be made as a self-consciousness for the task of freedom, as critical consciousness. So let's start with German idealism, and again, if you have any clarifications need, please ask a question. The German idealism is often attributed to Kant, Fichte, Hegel, but as I said, I'll be focusing primarily on Hegel. Um, I'm not going to provide like a broad overview of Hegel's system because you know I'm not well read to be able to do that. What I will do is just kind of provide a sort of discussion on the specific aspects of Hegel that really influence Marx. Again, I'll start with the quotes by Hegel. All that is real is rational, and all that is rational is real. Now that sounds like a bit confusing. Here the word real is not understood as what is, what the existing conditions are, but what they ought to be. Now notice here the is ought gap is not a moral gap. It's not that if it is wrong to cheat, I ought not to cheat. The distinction takes on a different meaning for Hegel, one that may seem contradictory. And a very famous distinction Hegel is known for is that juxtaposing between being, what is, and becoming, what ought to be, expresses the dialectical character of rationality. To make this dialectical character a bit more simple, I'll provide an example. Quote, in 1789, the French monarchy had become so unreal, that is to say, so robbed of all necessity, so irrational, that it had to be destroyed by the Great Revolution, of which Hegel always speaks with the greatest enthusiasm. In this case, therefore, the monarchy was the unreal, uh, and the revolution was real. And so, in the course of development, all that is previously real becomes unreal loses its necessity, its right of existence, its rationality." End quote. The French monarchy was real, but becomes unreal when the demands of the people, and of course the demands of the people for freedom, for equality, for prosperity, no longer culminates in the French monarchy. Yes? Isn't that, wasn't that more like the government fucked up? But it is how Hegel uses it. Re uh, really. Well, I'm glad I'm not a Hegelian. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Um, well, the thing with the French monarchy wasn't just the certain policies the government had, but the real problem of the thing was that people had no say, no freedom in doing what they want. Especially, you know, the third estates. There was sure, the clergy. Like the, the, the fact that you know, like the government went bankrupt and like there were famines and like a whole bunch of other things impacted. Yeah, but 
and it wasn't just the it was like you know like a whole bunch of other people rose up and like one hundred percent. Like it was but not I just, just think you know, it was not just like, oh, we are we are the bourgeoisie, we are gonna have a revolution. It well, it wasn't the bourgeoisie, that's what I'm saying. It, the bourgeoisie is often a term we ascribe to. But, but it wasn't even like, you know, petty proprietors in cities. Or the demands were bourgeois. That is, okay. to, yes. to, to make bourgeois okay. demands... That is, that is a good way, yes. If, yes. if we're going to be defining it that way, that is a good way. Yes. To the demands were bourgeois for equality, for the people to have a, not just a say, but also another thing that, you know, to say the French government fucked up or made a mistake, really the, the question is, is this a contingent kind of point and they weren't going to fuck up? Or is the point that no longer is French absolutism um, base necessary? Absolutism like, lived on um, throughout the rest of Europe, for, like, in some cases for the rest of the century, I'd say it's like, pretty contingent. Mm. They would be real, like but actually, it's, it's good you mentioned Bismarck. We'll actually get to Bismarck in a bit. Um, I won't really discuss Bismarck too much. But really, the thing that Hegel was observing, and Marx and Engels also observed, is that, at least in France, and I, I agree with you, absolutism did survive in Europe. It, it did survive. But ultimately, that was abolished as well. Absolutism, over time, doesn't um, culminate in the people's demands for freedom, for equality. That is why it is precisely this, you know, this is what Hegel is observing, the progress and the consciousness of freedom no longer culminated in the French monarchy. It no, it no longer allowed the people to express their own freedom and their own um, equal, sense of equality. Especially, you know, the, the French monarchy was, of course, very, you know, particular to having the clergy and the nobility as being the strongest, you know, the states. Um, so I think, you know, I, maybe perhaps we can also uh, provide a quote by Engels that may help us with the sort of dialectics between being and becoming. Here Engels says, truth lay now in the process of cognition itself, in the long historical development of science, which mounts from lower to ever higher levels of knowledge without ever reaching by discovering so-called absolute truth a point at which it can proceed no further, where it would become, where it would have nothing more to do than to fold its hands and gaze with wonder at the absolute truth to which it attained, which it had attained. Really here, I mean, the word absolute truth here was used, and it sounds like a bunch of nonsense, but really for Hegel, he was using the term absolute truth in regards to another term, the absolute spirit. Now what this meant for Hegel was, again, it comes back to the progression of freedom that really what the French monarchy, what was happening in the French Revolution and had happened um, differently in the American Revolution was this historical task towards freedom. This is really Hegel's idealism, that these sort of developments in freedom were kind of uh, also developments in the movement of this sort of absolute spirit, which is kind of a sort of a... It really, I guess it might be called a metaphysical idea. Can I, can I ask you another question about the French Revolution? Yes, please. Because I'm curious. Um, so in Hegel's mind, is it that, so because you have this um, uh, dialectic between being and becoming, yes. as you say. So is it that the, the, the overall status of the people and the French monarchy is the being and the French Revolution is the becoming something else? Or is he saying that the reason the French monarchy isn't real is because the people have already become something different. So they were becoming. Is becoming is a process, exactly. Right. So, so they're in the process of becoming, and in doing so, there's kind of these. I, I guess is Hegel saying that the French monarchy is kind of this a trapping of what of the being of previous societies, and it's already become something slightly different. Does um, that make sense? Sorry. I yeah. No, I think it does. I, so, in the French monarch during the French Revolution, yeah. the being was the French monarch. Right. Okay. It was that. That was. The, it was real. Mm 
mm-hmm. but it becomes unreal. And when he's again, as I said, he, he uses this re- the word real, not at what is. Mm-hmm. It's it's rational, and the p- demand of the people for freedom, for equality, for prosperity, war rationality. You know, he has, uh, he also has this term of a rational society. You know, w- often I think in university we often think of rational as you know this sort of very mechanical thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really for Hegel, the term rational is demand for freedom. That is what it is, and that's why. This state of becoming, beca- um, what the French people were demanding was this process of becoming. Yeah. And of course, the new becoming, um, le- well, let's say society after the French Revolution, mm-hmm. becomes the new being, the new yeah. state of society, and therefore that must be abolished. Mm-hmm. This is his negative, negative dialectics. This is the society is, I think I say somewhere here, is at a constant state of tension. There's a tension between what is, what the being is and the becoming. This is a constant tension. And really this is something that Marx also takes on board, which I will discuss later. Um, I think we, d- I discussed, <laughs> we discussed a lot of stuff I was going to say, so I think I'll just end this section with a quote by Korsh, and Korsh I think is very you know, informative on this. The greatest thinkers produced by bourgeois society in its revolutionary period, for example the French Revolution, regarded a revolution in the form of thought as an objective component of the total social process of a real revolution. You know, what Hegel was writing about, what Kant was writing about, what they were thinking about um, was a, a process of that revolution. They weren't just, you know, sitting in the armchairs thinking, of, oh, this was happening over there, I don't really care about it. Really, they were part of that revolutionary process. And Marx wants to be part of that too. Um, so, yep. did, did Hegel see that process towards rationality as one that was inevitable? Yes, necessity. Okay. He called okay. it, nece- and he also has this term, necessity. How society is right. Yes, and the process towards freedom is a necessary thing. Because, yeah. you know, being, <laughs> the, you know, the third estate was the majority. Mm-hmm. And of course the majority of the people have want fu- to be freer, to be more equal. And that was the demands that were being made. Those were the necessary demands that was bourgeois. So, if I can clarify, um, because obviously Marxists tend to be opposed to anything, like anything resembling the term idealism. So Not necessarily. Right, so what I'm asking is because, um, of course, um, Marx um, thought something that, that, funnily enough, a lot of Marxists actually disagree with now. I think you can say later in um, Marx's own life, he revised his view, where, where communism was an inevitability of yeah. capitalism. Um, whereas I think most people would, would disagree now, it's not, it's not inevitable, it's mm. something that could happen. Would you say that that belief in its inevitability is a porting over from Hegel? Hmm. Um, if I may, I think I'll keep that question a bit later. Okay, right. Yeah, because I, I'll get into it a bit later. That's good. So, yeah, please, could you keep that in mind. Yeah, no it's right. a good question. It's a good question. Um, so, um, moving on, I want to go to the 1840s. And, you know, why I want to go to the 1840s, the 1840s really are a very important uh, revolution, not just revolutionary, but the height of you know philosophical disputes, the philosophical tensions between Marx, the socialist utopians, uh, anarchism, and the young Hegelians, who Marx was a part of. You know, these philosophers were observing a world of a new industrial society, and it's important that this industrial society, as a sort of an objective t- transformation in society. Had, in, had emerged as a crisis of bourgeois society. Now, what does that mean? You know, to say that bourgeois society was in crisis is not to say that all previous societies were not in crisis. Really, that to say that industrial society was a crisis of bourgeois society was highlighting a new phenomenon, that is capital. Now, capital here is not just an economic category. You know, it's not just accumulated labor or something, but it is a social relation that indeed the accumulation of capital that was rapidly underway changed the structure of urban society. You know, these urban centers that were bourgeois, that were that d- depended on the free and uh, equal exchange of labor, were you know, reaching a co- contradiction. You know, the basis for free exchange was ex- uh, the free exchange of labor was being expressed as exploitation and poverty. Social relations became alien and the freedom and historical progress of you know, bourgeois society, of the French Revolution, of all other revolutions, seemed like it wasn't going anywhere. Um, you know, this was this sort of crisis was expressed as 
high unemployment, below living standard wages, domination of private property, these social antagonisms between workers and uh, um, bosses, uh, famine, alienation from labor, etc. These were all byproducts of this bourgeois society in crisis that now no longer were the people having a sort of a say, but I should say the people were having a sort of uh, achievement in freedom and equality, rather they were experiencing poverty, exploitation, famine and unemployment. This was the crisis of capital, that capitalism is really the expression of this contradiction. Yes? Sir, I think 1848, when like, these revolutions began. Yes, I'll get it. He's in Europe. Like yes. there was, he, there was very little like political freedom. Mm, yes. Um, so I don't know, like, what that has. I don't know whether that like confirms or complicates your theory. But like, it was not, you know, some like idealized. It know, wasn't. Yes. Neoclassical. We're meeting on an island and mm. be treating officially. Robustly. Right? Yes. Precisely. Not that. Not that. Yes. Yes. It wasn't, but the thing is that you know, bourgeois society isn't just that we just need a perfect monarchy. Bourgeois society is bourgeois social relations. It mostly speaks to those social relations between the people. Yeah, it's like how um, people believe that even while France was being an absolute monarchy at the time, that the court or, or um, a essentially absolutist republic, is people, like it was defended and argued for that this model is the defender of the revolution, which is mm -hmm. the bourgeois social yes. relations. Yes, exactly, that, that was. And in industrial society, this is expressed in a contradictory manner, that it, the crisis was real, that you know, the schools of French anarchism, social and utopianism, and um, also materialism were all you know, observing these crises and they were responding to it. It was a development, it, was a cr it, was, it wasn't just a hiccup, you know, a, a mistake from the development of the task for freedom in bourgeois society, but it was a very movement, this sort of industrial um, capital movement in contradiction. That, you know, at the same time we had technology improving, production was skyrocketing, profits increasing, new commodities increasing, but at the same time unemployment was a huge matter. People weren't getting enough wages, the wages were actually being driven down and people were going to exploitation, alienation and poverty. Really this is not a moral matter, it's a, it's a, it's a crisis of society, of industrial society. And therefore you know, Marx emerges into this to kind of critique this and understand what is happening as he really wants to clarify the task of socialism and the task of Hegelian, uh, or at least theory of Hegelian and post-Hegelian philosophy. You know, socialism didn't really start with Marx, it started before him, and what Marx wants to do is understand socialism as a symptom of capitalism. That socialism is a sort of a, a new bourgeois demand for, you know, equality, freedom, but that it expresses itself in a contradictory manner as well. Um, now we'd like to go to the next section, which uh, helps us, you know, also understand Marx's materialism, which is the critique of idealism. Um, I don't want to spend too long on this section. Rather, I think I'll quickly um, get into two critiques of idealism that will help us understand what Marx was experiencing in 1840s. The first one, the critique of the right Hegelians, and the second, Feuerbach's critique of Hegel. First, I'll start with the quote by Engels again. Namely, by conceiving the end of history as follows, he's talking about the Hegelian system, mankind arrives at the cognition of the self-same absolute idea and declares that this cognition of the absolute idea is reached in Hegelian philosophy. In this way, however, the whole dogmatic content of the Hegelian system is declared to be absolute truth in contradiction to his dialectical method which dissolves all dogmatism. So these, the right Hegelians, and I, I'm glad you brought up Bismarck, but I think they were actually experiencing this before Bismarck, the, French, the, the Germany of the 1840s. They kind of pronounced the, the Germany, the Prussia, the Prussian state, 
as the absolute idea. This is in a civil society that this is expressed. This was the expression of um, Hegel's rationality. They were expressing this, and what Engels wants to critique is that you know if we are in this constant state of negation of being and becoming really then to become the end of history, which is the contradiction. Isn't the end of history also supposed to be negated? So, you know, the, he, he, he observes the contradiction in this idealist philosophy, that if Hegel's philosophy is all about um, speculative negation of past ideas, really there, would, there wouldn't be an absolute truth that we would just keep negating. And this expresses itself in the Harite Hegelians. They declare the, the Prussia of the 1840s to be the absolute truth. However, you know, this was in the course that the Prussian state of the 1840s was very oppressive. It wasn't um, people who didn't have as much freedom. You could, it wasn't very liberal, and the demands for rationality weren't expressed. However, of course, you know the right Hegelians um, were, of course, you know, an expression of Hegel's philosophy. However, they were Hegel's conservatism, whereas Engels and Marx want to clarify Hegel's revolutionary ideas. And I will get into this revolutionary idea in the next section as well. Um, the next sort of critique, and before I actually get into the next critique, I'll prov um, it's important to note, as I said, that you know the, the conservative side of the right of the aliens was, uh, what's the word he used, relative. That this sort of relative expression was in the right of the aliens, and Marx actually says they fall below the master, Hegel. Whereas Marx and Hegel want to take on board the revolutionary aspect of Hegel. That is why you know, Marxism is not a rejection of idealism in the way that it's often, you know, a Marxists often think of it. Really, it's taking up the task of, Marx, of idealism. And you know, the, also, the, the sort of the clarifications that Marx and Engels make on idealism is also very heavily influenced by Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, to quickly go on to Ludwig Feuerbach, Ludwig Feuerbach um, wants critiques um, the development of Hegel's idealism as a sort of uh, very abstract metaphysical idea of this absolute spirit. So, you know, I, you know, a lot of you were like, absolute spirit, that's complete bullshit. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. Feuerbach provides the critique of the absolute spirit. As Engels says, um, Feuerbach is able to clarify that the Hegelian pre-mundane existence of the absolute idea, the pre-existence of the logical categories before the world existed is nothing more than the fantastic survival of the belief in the existence of an extra mundane creator, that the material, sensuously perceptible world to which we ourselves belong is the only reality, and that our own consciousness and thinking, however suprasensuous they may seem, are, product, are products of really a material bodily organ, the brain. He uh, Feuerbach's materialism aims to clarify this. I won't get into this philosophy of the religious man, but very briefly, by clarifying this, he, he formulates this idea of a almost atheist religious man. And what he means by that is that no longer does God, does the absolute spirit, descend from heaven to earth. Really, when a religious man only alienates his own ideas of love, of respect, of benevolence, alienates it as God. Therefore, really, God ascends from earth to heaven. Seems contradictory, but, you know, for Feuerbach, this was the real material basis that was developing. And therefore, he seculari secularizes religion. Man, particularly the religious man, is the measure of all beings, of all reality. This, was all, this is also Feuerbach's sort of idealism. And actually, I'll get into Feuerbach's idealism. Before I get into the next section, any clarifications, any questions that anyone has? Okay. Uh, no, yeah. I just think it's interesting that this 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 really does confirm Marx's status as a as a I mean truly bourgeois intellectual. Mm, precisely. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, which you know, I don't know. I think it's funny that it took us until the autonomists to maybe think about that a little bit. Mm, yeah. Right. No. Yeah. Precisely. He is a bourgeois intellectual. Yeah. Thinker. It's interesting. Mm, yes. And, it, but he's a bourgeois intellectual thinker, and I'll get into this in the sense that he wants to supersede bourgeois philosophy. He critique, his critique of Hegel, but also of Feuerbach, is really the clarification of freedom. And I'll, and I'll actually get into the critique of Feuerbach now. Crisis of materialism. 
So now that we're after Feuerbach, after Engels, we can actually get into enter Marx. Marx, as this young Hegelian, comes into fruition, into these debates. Am I charging? Okay, my charging is fine. <laughs> and you know what was essential for Marx is that a true understanding of materialism is not one that completely does away from idealism, with Hege Hegelian idealism, but one is that able to grasp the real historical essence of Hegel's system. You know, Feuerbach's materialism, as the towering figure of all materialism before Marx, falls into this very error and is not dealing with critically with idealism. Um, by rep and it, rep it really replaces one form of idealism with another. You know, materialism attempts to clarify the real material basis for our activity, our brain, but really it falls into the, its greatest debt. Enter Marx as the young Hegelian, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels into these debates, into the crit debates between idealism, materialism, socialism, anarchism, and feel the need to you know, clarify what the task of social transformation is. What was essential for Marx is that a true understanding of materialism you know, doesn't do away with Hegelian idealism, like I've said. Um, move on to, moving on to the quote, actually, I had, which is on, if you know, Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, um, that the thing, reality, sensuous, is conceived only in the form of the object of contemplation, but not as sensuous human activity practice, not subjectivity. This was Marx's critique of Feuerbach's idealism. That, you know, Feuerbach has this notion of the abstract man. This abstract man is loving, caring, benevolent. But really, this, ab this abstract man falls into a new idealism. You know, his idealism, um, kind, he tries to critique German idealism, but he falls into his own idealism of this religious man. Also, I just thought, if you have any questions, you can ask anytime. Easy that you know, when he says that uh, attempts to ascend God from earth to heaven, he only does so in contemplation, in thought, and that he really doesn't grasp what is the basis for material activity. His intuitions, abstract intuitions, based on love and respect, are as realistic as the form is idealistic. Hence, in contradiction to materialism, the active side was developed um, abstractly by idealism, which of course does not know real sensuous activity. So, you know, Hegelian idealism does have this notion of activity of, um, you know, when he was talking about the French Revolution, he was conceiving of the French people as acting on reality, but he only has, he only understands this very abstractly. And that's what, that is what Marx wants to clarify. Now, I mentioned sensuous activity here. Now, sensuous activity refers to a self-conscious process of both abstraction, but also practical activity. You know, I, I, there's this thing and I act on it to understand, to grasp what the object is. And the object is, of course, reality, society. Any contemplation of social transmobility is, therefore, for Marx, a process, but also a process that happens within the species, you know, within communities and not as, you know, as Feuerbach sees of it, as this individual abstract religious man. That, you know, when he says it's just one religious man that we can base all of reality on, really for Marx, it's the community, it's the species that changes and, um, you know, creates social transformation. The relation of reality to philosophy, which Hegelian and post-Hegelian philosophies were attempted to clarify, influences and is culminated in Marx. Um, I think the second, I'll skip over the second critique of materialism because I wanted to create more discussion at the end of this. Um, the second critique of materialism, just briefly, is just that, again, materialism doesn't perceive of history as a process. That really, why Feuerbach was just falling back into idealism was that he was conceiving of all of history as the development of this religious man, this religious, loving, abstract man. While, whereas what Hegel had, he, knew, he understood that the task of progression of freedom was a historical task and that the conditions, the given conditions, were constantly being contradicted by this by intention with the demand of freedom, which changes over time. It comes with bourgeois society. To say that you know, bourgeois society is a new historical 
step in the progression of freedom is precisely the historical um, understanding that Feuerbach doesn't have. Um, to end the section for Hegel, it was our ideas, our understanding of concepts in speculation, but also abstract practice that influence the historical process of change. Feuerbach, on the other hand, doesn't have in mind any historical understanding of social transformation and therefore falls below his man's master. It is Marx who takes Hegel back up. A start was made from his revolutionary side and develops a historical and material understanding of the movement for freedom. However, as has been said, Marx does not make a break from Hegelian idealism, rejecting all philosophical fantasy of bourgeois philosophy by returning them to their material essence. Rather, he is clarifying the task as it is unfolding in the 1840s. Moving on to the final section of today's teaching, revolutionary theory and practice. After Hegel being dropped by post-Hegelians such as Feuerbach and replaced instead by a materialism still holding the thin idealism, Marx felt not only the need to articulate the historical task of freedom, but also the practical problem of all hitherto philosophy. What Marx attempts in order to really supersede German idealism and materialism you know, is not to create a brand new theory of social transformation, but to point out imminent um, and inherent contradictions within each of these systems that really point beyond themselves. That German idealism had a revolutionary pr potential that was smothered in its mystification of the absolute spirit and abstraction of human action, whereas materialism never considered the historical development of the task for freedom. Therefore, a return to Hegel was made to understand the dialectical relationship between theory and practice, between the object of contemplation, society, and the subject, human species. But, you know, wait a second, wasn't the reason Marx dropped idealism because it was theory without practice? Didn't he just want to go into practice? You know, that's when he says in the final thesis on Feuerbach, and I think many of you may know this, philosophers have thus only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. Doesn't he mean that the point is to act? That social transformation can only be achieved through practical activity? For, uh, when he, but really, when he clarifies materialism by adding sensuous human activity, he isn't also not creating a novel idea about human action, but rather taking on the ideas and theories, particularly I want to focus on also a bit on Rousseau, um, and practice the practical, I'm oh, sorry, Rousseau, Kant, and Hegel, by pointing out this issue. Um, the key distinction, or rather non-identity of theory, our philosophical abstractions of reality and society and practice, our practical activity, um, we, um, the practical census activity we undertake to change, to maintain reality. For example, you know, building a house, cutting down trees, art. The distinction here starts with Rousseau. I would like to um, quote Chris Catron here, but first society had to be made clear about its aims, in practice as well as in theory. Rousseau was the first to articulate this new modern task of social freedom. Rousseau is the first because he poses the question of freedom in both the state of nature and society. Really, he's trying to kind of outline how, how we thought about you know, certain ideals, certain bourgeois demands, but also how, we, how our freedom was expressed in the state of nature influences our activity. He, um, in his, you know, the famous book Origins of the Inequality, Origins of the Inequality of something, I forgot the name, and the other one uh, in the Social Contract, he's trying to articulate the non-identity of theory and practice. Hegel takes this on board, and the gap for him between theory and practice you know, still remains one of the most important philosophical questions, but more so that Hegel himself was experiencing actual revolutions first with the American Revolution, but then the French Revolution. History was progressing right before his eyes, and theory had a stake in the process of social transformation in our practice. Uh, I would like to provide one extensive quote from Hegel, which I think actually provides this, uh, this sort of non-identity and tension between theory and practice. Rousseau already placed absolutes in freedom. Kant possesses the same principle only in a more theoretical version. 
The French regard it from the point of view of the will. For they have a proverb, I'm going to butcher this, Il a la tête de He is hot-headed. Uh, France has a sense of reality, of accomplishment, because ideas there are translated more directly into action. Consequently, men there have applied themselves practically to reality. However much freedom in itself is concrete, in France it was applied to reality in an underdeveloped and abstract form. And to, to establish abstraction in reality is to destroy that reality. The fantasism of freedom, when the people took possession of it, became terrible. In Germany, the same principle aroused the interest of consciousness, but was only developed in a theoretical manner. Now, it, it appears incredibly materialistic of Hegel to say this. You know, he's, he's very clearly articulating the tensions between theory and practice. And the problems of philosophy, which is precisely why Marx himself is a Hegelian. He understands that the problems of philosophy is essentially a problem of how theory and practice correlate, of how they inform each other. But he also understands it, the revolutionary side, that the dialectical movement of society towards freedom is the self-consciousness of philosophy in society. Again, going back to this concept of bourgeois, society, bourgeois philosophy, really bourgeois philosophy, is the self-consciousness of, um, so bourgeois philosophy is the self-consciousness of bourgeois society, of the movement towards freedom. You know, if one has a theory of socialism, you know, as, as did the utopian socialists, the, the sense of, um, the, the real question is then how can this concept be truly realized, or how the truth in Hegelian sense of freedom can be achieved. As he says in the second thesis on Feuerbach, the question whether objective truth can be attributed to human thinking is not a question of theory, but is a practical question. Man must prove the truth, i.e. the reality and power, the decidedness of his thinking, if practice. Note that he must prove his thinking. He must put his theory into practice. He must understand the, the, con the, the tension that exists between theory and practice. Therefore, after the French Revolution and the beginning of the 1840s, as Marx was registering this crisis of Hegelianism and of bourgeois society, and we talked about the crisis of bourgeois society in the 1840s, expressed in the crisis of capital, um, he was also experiencing the real possibility for social emancipation. Like you mentioned, 1848, there were revolutions happening in Europe that had in mind the potential for you know something new, for something better, and although you know a lot of them didn't really work out, they didn't really, they just went back into the form of conservatism. What's important for them that he was experiencing a real, the real, I guess, movement of this theory and practice. And um, the, the, the stuff he writes on 1848, if any of you have read, kind of highlights this as well. Um, it is with this thought of social transformation and socialism that Marx returns to Hegel. As Engels puts it, puts him back on his feet. I quote Catron again, as it was for Hegel, Marx's fundamental philosophical issue is this. How is it possible, if however problematic, to be a self-conscious agent of change? If what is being transformed includes oneself, or more precisely, an agency that transforms conditions both for one's practical grounding and for one's theoretical self-understanding in the process of acting. Um, so this was the real tension that was happening between theory and practice. I've already outlined critiques of Hegel, so to finish this section I will briefly return to a phrase I've been saying at the beginning of the teaching, to make philosophy worldly, and how this is ultimately attempting to respond to the ultimate problem. Philosophy, as I said, has previously become world, uh, sorry, the world had become philosophical in bourgeois philosophy. It was able to provide a system of understanding and even change society. However, bourgeois philosophy had become insufficient, that the practices of the people and the bourgeoisie were creating a crisis-prone industrial society rather than progressing to this sort of absolute idea of freedom. The experiences and symptoms of the 1840s were the cum culmination of this crisis. As Korsch puts it, the bourgeois standpoint, that of free labor, equal exchange, you know, this notion I, this talk, uh, a concept I mentioned of equal exchange, free exchange, etc., has to stop in theory 
where it has to stop in social practice. As long as it does not want to cease being a bourgeois standpoint altogether, in other words, supersede itself. Bourgeois, society, bourgeois philosophy must supersede itself because it has become insufficient in industrial society. No longer do our theories of equal exchange, of free labor, really culminate in people's freedom, in people's equality. But this suppression is, uh, has, has been emphasized as not a total rejection, but an imminent understanding of this. It is not a rejection of either theory or practice that will resolve the crisis but rather through the contradiction expressed that socialism can be achieved. To say that the theory and practice have become contradictory means that the theoretical and abstract conceptions of society, free labor, rights and wealth, no longer change or manifest themselves into our daily practical activity. And going back to your question actually about you know, what's communism, is it the next necessary as a st standpoint? Really, it's not necessarily communism, but Marx was saying that socialism is a necessity because not of ideas necessarily, but also because um, production necessarily pointed to socialism. That capitalism really it was kind of pointed towards socialism. And that the necessity here, again, is not a point on ideas, as was for Hegel. You know, for Hegel, it was the development of ideas. Yes, please. Why is capitalism pointing towards socialism? Mm, good question. Um, <laughs> sure, I, I don't mind. Um, so before you have capitalism, you don't have any kind of mass socialized production, really. You yes. have peasants working in their houses at best, maybe with a, like a dozen people at most. Even guilds are not like guild production was not really large scale. It was a lot of small producers working with shopkeepers. Hmm? Shopkeepers. Right, yeah, they, but the, the, the actual creation of goods did not involve many hands working to create the same so thing. So there are examples of like pretty large scale production by modernity industrial society, commercial society. Um, Such as? I mean, obviously stuff like the pyramids, you know, Great Wall of China, but also um, there's examples of like large scale commons projects that like involve all these communities coming together. Um, I, I was recently reading about this like community in Bali. This has had like I can't remember the scale. So there's like thousands of people just like working on this integrated like uh, network of irrigation mm. uh, I, over the course of like thousands of years. I think the point isn't that that without capitalism this doesn't happen. Mm. It's that capitalism kind of makes this happen in every single area of production. It's right, also like that um, what emerges in capitalism is the commodity form. Oops, right. I step on something. Um, again, as I was mentioning in, in the in section of the 1840s, and, and bourgeois society really, the thing that emerges with bourgeois society is, like you said, it is the socialization of labor, but also the basis for free exchange. Mm -hmm. That, you know, in, in these sort of ancient societies you talked about, really there wasn't any exchange, you just yeah, need... kind of was a lot of markets, actually. <laughs> Not uh, those markets, but what was what's kind of a bit um, different production, here? Production for self-sustainability dominated everywhere before capitalism. Mm. You but would exchange your labor to sustain yourself. That that, yeah. that that that's the basis of equal exchange and labor, the free exchange. Uh, yes, sorry. I would also perhaps say that like uh, what you're seeing with capitalism is like an internationalization of that process, like the, the scale. Of which, like, so yeah, like, seeing, like, an increase, but this, like, but like, for instance, like the pyramids of Giza, yeah, so that's like based within the pyramid was on a commodity, also. Well, it's, not a, well, it's not, it's not, not a commodity, but like, it is also like, these large scale projects, yeah, but they're like based within like a single okay, so country. So, what about something like the Roman Empire, which had both considerable trade and also had, you know, these giant like road networks and that. Mm. So is the Roman Empire nearly industrialized? Okay. Yeah, yeah actually, it's like a good thing about the Roman Empire, um, I, I haven't discussed him, but Adam Smith really takes mm. a lot, he, he discusses the Roman Empire in depth. Oh, For he, yeah, he does, in his Wealth of Nations. The Roman Empire, he takes a lot of influence from mm. the markets of the Roman Empire. But really, this is something I really want to highlight here, that, again, you know, this bourgeois, bourgeois society emerges both as an objective but also subjective as in 
how I experience society emerges as a new transformation in, in how peop in people's social relations. The social relation I have, for example, to you, if you're let's say a baker, is only expressed in my relation that you sell something to me. It becomes a sort of our social relation is um, expressed in that form of exchange. Whereas in I guess in ancient society, this relationship really was a it was a communal relationship. Yeah, but yeah, you know, cities where people like sold stuff and acted in more anonymous ways. Like I, I, I think I, I think you, you, you might be missing the forest for the trees a little bit, right? Like the point is is that, that stuff it, it, we're not saying that, that stuff only existed under capitalism. We're talking about the the one, the scale and two even the method of production. Like the, the, the point um, by the socialization of labor is that producing like any single object under now whether or not early 19th century probably not but by the late 19th century 100 percent involved so many more hands and so much more exchange than on pretty much any other previous oh of production. definitely that's the point right and the reason that this points to socialism but, I mean, is because it makes workers work together to make the same shit and you're right, the, the capitalism really came into fruition in the 1840s. That, that, that is precisely why you know, the 1840s are sort of a very important section here, because the 1840s, they express capital at its almost highest contradiction. Honestly, well, I mean, the, 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 in Lenin stuff, I don't want to get into that. Really, it expresses this sort of, uh, this sort of almost, th that, that's why 1848, the revolutions happened, because the demands for socialism really try to express themselves in 1848 because, uh, as you say, th this sort of industrial society was happening. Um, I think we can return to back to this point. Well, I had another question. Yeah, yeah, please, please. You had this thing about like, like bourgeois philosophy mm -hmm. um, is pointing towards like full human emancipation. Yes. And like Marx is like, we need like there are limitations to that, so we need... Well, it's not limitations. The point that he was trying to make was that bourgeois philosophy as a theory was no longer sufficient or it was becoming contradictory in expressing the conditions of 1840s. There wasn't a... I mean, I guess you can... I guess I, limitations I, I, are my, another... My, my main point is just like, I don't feel like it was ever... Like it was ever? It was never like pointing towards that. Ah. Like, but like I think that... Like I the think philosophers are like... There's like a lot of like... I think this bourgeois philosophy is like a lot of like fear of the mob, the mob stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, like sure. there's like those those do ideas. Know, do you know how many Enlightenment thinkers supported democracy? Not many. Not many. <laughs> but, but like, so so is like the point that they got to like liberal democracy and well, Enlightenment, mm -hmm. and then and then like that was a stage that you needed to get through through past feudalism to then get to socialism, or was that mm, like yeah. they, were, they were aiming at human emancipation, but mm, like quickly? Precisely. Uh, glad you brought up, because and, uh, he also, you know, he, like I said, a lot of people, I guess, didn't really say to support a democracy, but for Hegel, monarchy was the expression of Papuja society. Mm. That, you know, the, the, the sovereign, the, this, the head of the nation, was supposed to um, act on the will of the people. That he, that, you know, it sounds funny, but he was for him, and that's why I guess the right Hegelians take the Prussian state as to be the ultimate, um, as to be a sort of a very, per, you know, perfect civil society, really. And I think you kind of missed this with my bourgeois philosophy thing, but really, <laughs> no, that's fine. I'll just go briefly over it. Really, bourgeois philosophy was, bec and I, I'll actually quote um, Kors again. I think it helps us. Where is it? Uh, I don't know, I lost it. I think it's here. Um, ah, yes, I think it is here. Yes, Kosh. The greatest thinker produced by bourgeois society in this revolutionary period regarded a revolution in the form of thought, in your thinking, as an objective component of the total social process of a real revolution. So, you know, what, and he says this is largely begins with Hegel and Kant. That when Kant and Hegel were writing about the sort of the emergence of bourgeois society, of free exchange, of people being able, of people having these certain powers over their own society, mm -hmm. 
This was their expression of bourgeois society. And there was another quote on the French Revolution. Hegel speaks admirably of the French Revolution because it is precisely the movement towards freedom. It is the people's movement towards freedom, equality, and prosperity. So really, I guess, you know, I'm at a poor time frame on it, who knows? But really, this, this sort of bourgeois philosophy really culminates in how Hegel understands the course of development. We get this with Smith and Kant as well. But Hegel, as the culmination of all of this, understood that how that our development of ideas mm -hmm. of the concept is starting to culminate into revolution mm -hmm. that that's what the french revolution was for him but as he said it was developed abstract i think i think the point about that with with regards to bourgeois philosophy um to not try and like try and answer your question as well is is i don't think marx would actually just like as you're saying like the bourgeois philosophy never really aimed at like true true freedom if we analyze it critically. But I think that it's true that it makes all of these promises. And all of these promises of freedom and equality are what kind of agitates and pushes for the revolution. Well, and what I think I would say is that what I imagine Marx is basically saying is that I'm doing bourgeois philosophy better than all of the other bourgeois. Because he's saying that the, these guys are wrong when they think that their ideas of liberty and freedom culminate in capitalism. Actually, they culminate in socialism. Well, not really, because <laughs> because because I mean, Kant didn't really experience capitalism, really, and Hegel also was experiencing capitalism in a sort of an underdeveloped way. Mm. So it's not just that when Marx, he, he, you're right, he's trying to do bourgeois philosophy, but when he he's not, he's not saying you're just wrong. He's mm -hmm. saying that bourgeois philosophy has become contradictory in industrial society. Right. It no longer it, it no longer is the development of our ideas, of our thoughts of of equal exchange, of free labor, of um, you know uh, even the monarchy even. Like the monarchy as the highest form of, of, of bourgeois as, as a form of bourgeois society, these ideas no longer live up to the moment. They have become self contradictory. That's really what he wants to highlight. It's not just that, you know, ah, uh, Hegel, that's a lot of bullshit. No, he's really, yeah, yeah he, he's, 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 or not he's saying he's wrong, really, he's trying to highlight how, as I said, you know, Engels says that Marx wants to put Hegel back on his feet because Hegel has become inverted in industrial society. And this is best expressed both in the right of aliens, as I was saying about, the pro as they were theorizing about Prussia, but also precisely in, you know, Feuerbach as a critique of Hegel was also kind of, he was still living in Hegel's time, but we were not living in Hegel's time. We were living in industrial society. So that, and uh, this is kind of what I was trying to highlight with industrial society, there's a new demand. The demand is socialism. And the demand for socialism really is a symptom of the of society, of bourgeois society crisis. And therefore, Marx comes and he wants to clarify the task, both for socialism, but the task for freedom. I he wants to clarify that. I want to clarify something because I think I think if that's true, that leads us almost. It's funny to to say that bourgeois philosophy isn't created during bourgeois society. It's actually almost created in the step beforehand. That seems to be the conclusion there, right? So is most of the no, communist theory. I, to be fair. Right, like. Sorry, what? So is most of the communist theory. Well, <laughs> all of it. Yeah, the socialism. <laughs> so, socialism was like was before if, Marx. If, yeah. If what Marx is is saying is that um, we have all of this bourgeois philosophy that no mm -hmm. longer actually makes sense in industrial society that's being misused. It's become contradictory. Yeah, right. To make sense, I it's... Oh, sure, sure. It's become contradictory. It's, um, as in, its ideals are contradictory the, 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 the fact of what's the, going on. The theory yeah. doesn't live up to the practice. Yeah. I guess it's recording. Um, one thing, um, what Korsh is trying to highlight is mm -hmm. that bourgeois philosophy does emerge with the emergence of bourgeois society. That bourgeois philosophy this culminates in Hegel, is the self-consciousness of bourgeois society. So it's not just bourgeois philosophy developed before bourgeois society. Really, and this is actually something Hegel says, that um, any philosophy is the thought of that era, of its epoch. It's the thought of that epoch. Precisely, this is, I mean, it's, it's almost culminated in himself. When he's theorizing about you know, the absolute sphere, about um, the, the development of society, his philosophy is the philosophy of his epoch of the bourgeois society. So he, it really develops as bourgeois society comes into fruition, as these 
new social relations are starting to appear as revolutions are happening. He's experiencing this and he's theorizing about it. And his theory is informing how society develops. And the point that Marx is trying to make, and I think I'll put, quote another thing from, from Koch, he's very um, engaging. The real contradiction between Marx's scientific socialism and all bourgeois philosophy and sciences consists entirely in the fact that scientific socialism is the theoretical expression of a revolutionary process, which will end with the total abolition of these bourgeois philosophies and sciences, together with the abolition of the material relations that find their ideological expression in them. To abolish philosophy means not, as not, um, it's not to completely do away with fantasies, but it's to realize that the only way for socialism to um, really come into fruition is to A, understand the dialectical development of theory and practice, and the, sorry, of the history, and to understand the relationship between theory and practice. That's the real thing. Um, I, I'm very over time. I'm just going to end to the concluding bits. Uh, we're basically doing Q&A and emerge to talk, so it's all good. Um, so two paragraphs to conclude the session, and you know we've already been doing Q&A already, so I'll just do 20 minutes of Q&A as well. To end the teaching, I would like to pose a second question regarding Marxism relationship with philosophy, the states of Marxism after Marx. Very clearly, um, the focal point of this teaching, the book that Co Course wrote in 1923, which was also titled Marxism and Philosophy, asked the very same questions we are asking today. What is the relationship of Marxism and philosophy? But more so, writing in the context of a regression in Marxism, expressed as Marxism in the Second International. The task of Marxism was taken up, but as Course puts it, in a vulgar way completely rejecting the philosophical roots of Marxism, the same way post hegelian philosophers dropped Hegel. Those very philosophical roots that inform his revolutionary theory and practice, and not as the epigons imagine, uh, quote, as the epigons imagine, that all philosophy is shown to be mere fantasy. It only expresses a categorical rejection of all theory, philosophical or scientific, that is not at the same time practice real, terrestrial, imminent, human, and sensuous practice, and not the speculative activity of the philosophical idea that basically does nothing but comprehend itself. What the Second International and many Marxists later did was rid Marxism of all its philosophical roots, and therefore revolutionary potential for social transformation was also gone. The philosophical problem of theory and practice that Marx was dealing with manifests itself precisely in the Second International. In this teaching, we ask the question of what philosophy meant for Marx and Marxism, as well as how the long philosophical and historical developments of Hegel, Feuerbach, and the revolution impacted his critique. The crisis of bourgeois society largely shaped discourses regarding the issue of social transformability and what it would mean to end philosophy. I will finish with Korsch. Instead of making an exit, classical German philosophy, the ideological expression of the revolutionary movement of the bourgeoisie, made a transition to a new science, which henceforth appeared in the history of ideas as a general expression of the revolutionary movement of the proletariat, the theory of scientific socialism first founded and formulated by Marx and Engels in the 1840s. That concludes the session. <laughs> um, there will be an, we have time for a 30 minutes um, Q&A. Just some recommended reading if anyone wants some. Fils on Feuerbach by Marx is very um, good. German Ideology, Marx and Engels, Ludwig Feuerbach and the End of Classical German Ideology by Engels, and of course Marx and Manfred by Korsch. So now we can, you know, we've been doing Q&A for the whole thing. Yeah, sorry if you feel like No, no, it's, all, it's great. I want to sit down a bit. Go on. So I was curious what um, Marx and Engels had to do with Feuerbach. Like, what was the difference between them? Like, what would like some clarification because mm -hmm. almost all of the major bourgeois thinkers that have been mentioned are kind of pre the domination of capitalism over society. Yes. Like you can say that they existed in bourgeois society in the sense that they were writing probably after the abolition of serfdom. Um, right? but yeah, yes, yes, yes. Like what does it mean to exist in bourgeois society where capitalist social relations are actually still a very small minority of social relations? 
So, mm. so what does bourgeois society mean yeah. in that sense? Um, bourgeois society is not capitalism, that's the point. That, right, okay. Yes, precisely. Yes, bourgeois society, that, that's what I've been saying. Like, mm. Capitalism is bourgeois society in crisis. So bourgeois society really emerges before that. And it, it emerges as the, you know, like you're right, it is, it is also expressed as the abolition of serfdom, but also the ab abolition of the clergy as a sort of this major class that, you know, dominates every living aspect of us. Yes. In that case, you can probably make a case that like only a couple countries were bourgeois until like the twenty, until like the First World War. That's the thing. That's another good question because, like, when we say a society is bourgeois, we're not saying that every aspect of the society is bourgeois. It's it's a it's a it's a process that there is a sort of there there is, there is starting to be a qualitative if shift. Something as like momentous as the First World War, like mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think um, like there's like a this is like a big question, um, like in Russia, because they were like not um, they were they didn't have capital social relations yet, and like capital mm. came and like um, uh, the one that Engels wrote about Manchester and that like um, about the conditions of the English working class, and right. it comes mm. to them and they're like. This is fucked. We need, and like the Narodniks, so the SRs, That's they're like, their whole thing is like, we need to stop capitalism from coming here. So you know what's funny? There are actually other groups um, who really liked Marx's capital, and they were like, we're into this because we want Russia to become capitalist, because that means Russia will become strong. They were really nationalists. Yeah. They wanted Russia to like become a mighty, you know, take its place again. It's like people mighty. like the cadets and stuff. Yeah, um, so you have people you have people who are like reading capital and were like, I want I want capitalism to come to Russia and like they were seeing Marx as like I don't know if they're seeing Marx as pro capitalist, but they were definitely like reading him in the first Yeah, I mean way. Lenin Lenin talks about how pretty much every bourgeois member of um, like the con the, con the assembly at the time of the revolution uh, he loved Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Russia is an interesting example because you're right, capitalism there hasn't really developed as much as it had in the rest of Europe. And that's why Lenin in some sense does still want a sort of a bourgeoisification of Russia. But what he also recognizes, and I think what he, and that's why I think actually Korsh was writing about 1923, and he was precisely responding to the crisis of the Second International. And how Lenin clarifies Marxism. He, he clarifies Marxism because not only does he understand that the need for a sort of, of, of um, bourgeois demands, but also that no longer would bourgeois society be sufficient. That's why he, he um, highlights that we, we don't want just a bourgeois revolution. We really need to see that a bourgeois revolution is no longer sufficient to the demands of the people, of rationality. And again, this is also Marxist Hegelianism, that you know the, the demands of the people of the freedom and rationality no longer culminate in bourgeois society. It's an imminent critique, as I've been saying. Yeah. I, um, yep. So another follow up to the to the previous line of questioning. So if we're talking about how like like capitalism is like the inevitable sick ending of bourgeois philosophy, if that's what we're kind of saying. Mm, um, well. Interesting thing, actually, Marx rarely uses the term capitalism, right? Right. He, he rarely uses the term. He talks about capital, commodities, mm -hmm. production. He does use the term bourgeois, bourgeois and bourgeoisie a lot, right? And that is, again, kind of why, you know, capitalism isn't an expression of bourgeois philosophy, as it's, it's like bourgeois society in crisis. Um, I, I think maybe I should have clarified this, but when, when I say that, again, bourgeois society is in crisis, that the, the sort of the bourgeois conditions that were existing, so first we had you know, these employer relations, these equal exchange, I would exchange my labor, I would get it back. And there was also the, also, also production was becoming, sorry, um, labor was becoming more productive. Society was producing on a mass scale to create not only new commodities, new needs, new wants. People were prospering. That that was bourgeois society, and that this reaches a contradiction in, in industrial society because we get unemployment. 
we have these masses of people no longer uh, partaking in the, the social surplus of society. And that when I exchange my labor for you know wages, I, really I'm being exploited. That the, I'm not getting right. Yeah, yeah, I guess like I'm really I'm like actually struggling to get my head around this because like I like it's I uh, so Marx says bourgeois class is the class that is oppressed. Mm-hmm. Is he? He's also imagining the factory owners. You, well, the term bourgeoisie does I think refer to the owners of capital. Yes. Right. Right. But. But yes, he uses bourgeoisie in that sense, but really the term bourgeois, mm-hmm. again, it comes from the French word city man. So to, so okay, so, so when, when you say bourgeois, or at least when Marx says bourgeois society, he, at least at first, he's not saying the society of factory owners and banks, he's saying the society of like intelligentsia men. Well, factories were emerging in bourgeois society. Yeah, of course, of course. So, um, so yes, they were. The, the, the sort of particular aspect that um, emerges with industrial society is that now these factories were not only producing on a such a large scale, but they also depended on this sort of capital accumulation. Mm-hmm. Now, the pro- problem with capital accumulation is the fact that my labor, our labor, is... Um, taken up is not taken up, I guess, um, what's the word, valorized? I think that's the word, valorization, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's done. Alienated. Yeah, uh, alienated into the, the, the sake of production. Mm-hmm. And also 1848, right? 1848 was really a crisis of overproduction. That we were producing so much, but people couldn't afford things. Mm-hmm. Production was exploding, that the fact that, also the, there's also the problem of machinery, which I, th- I won't talk about right now, mm-hmm. but the problem of overproduction was that people didn't have enough money to kind of buy things. That was the crisis, that people were unemployed, they were being exploited, they were being alienated. This was the crisis of bourgeois society. That the, the factories that were emerging in, like kind of in a semi kind of, you know, Adam Smith writes about it, you know, the, you know that example of the nails, right? You know, someone hands the nail. They were kind of, the factory was emerging in a sort of a premature way. Mm-hmm. The factory really emerges and develops fully, as you said, in 1840s. And that's why Marx is experiencing, as Marx is registering this crisis of the factory. Not just factory, really, of social relations, of how we buy things, of how we interact with society and other people. So something I was going to say when I was talking about like Russia is like, like Russian society isn't capitalist and it doesn't really become it until, depending on your perspective, until the 1920s. Um, it's very permissive. The yeah, the it's like, but, but, but like, it is a bourgeois society because bourgeois ideals, no matter like the monarch, are on well, their way in. Like, it, like the the, the monarch, like the monarch, whether or not they're a liberal, like um, one uh, of the Nicholases was a liberal. Yeah, like it's like you get like some liberals, you get some conservatives, but they're on their way in, and every single time that like. Industrialization and like like uh, getting the serfs off the land and turning them into proletariat. Every time that that's like halted in the favor of the class interests of the old aristocracy, Russia is like held back and like is less competitive on the world market because like Russia is like um, it, like Lenin writes about this. It's like is also like like raw materials are also like it's like being extract like it's getting value extracted away, away from it by like European powers. Um, well, Ru- Russia doesn't really become bourgeois. I mean, so there was a 1905 revolution or uprising, the mass revolt. Yeah. That was kind of a it was sort of a bourgeois demand. Russia really doesn't start become bourgeois until 1917. So it's like it's like developing. It was developing. Like, there's, like, there's like an undercurrent. Same same thing as like. The French Revolution, like it doesn't, it doesn't like mm-hmm. take hold, and that's like the part of the reason that like Russia stays so like like economically backwards for so long is that they don't have the political structure to support like the economic structure that they're trying to build. Mm. Well, the thing about bourgeois society is also that it's not just a political structure; it's a social relation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for so. sure. But I think yeah, you're right. The, the, also, that you know, in in, in some sense, um, bourgeois relations do also arise as sort of an economic relations. 
they're not just social that but you but know you need, but you need bikes you need like the, the so like well you need like the social, social relations the are the, uh, oh yes. The, mm, yes and then like all but they're all part of like an emerging process mm. that like mm. gives birth to yes. the bourgeois society. in some sense the french revolution was the demands of the bourgeois social relations politically yeah it, it was that bourgeois society was ex- trying to free itself in politics i, I guess that's the, the bit that, that that I'm getting tripped up on because mm-hmm. I, when 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 I hear the word bourgeois society, I imagine the concept that like bourgeois social relations are yes like total basically not not at 100 percent obviously no 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 mode of production can be 100 percent social relations but like so so then that's why I'm confused when you seem to be referring to like pre. 1840s, 1860s societies as bourgeois societies, mm-hmm. when the fact is that most of them were still dominated by peasant lifestyles. Mm-hmm. So, like that, that's why I'm kind of mm-hmm. getting tripped yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was there was peasantry, yes, mm-hmm. but but the peasants were also becoming bourgeois. That they were also that they were also not only going to the cities, but they were also the way they produced was also coming some expressed in a sort of a bourgeois manner. It was kind of it was underdeveloped, as you say. Really, again, the, the main factor was these cities. It was these urban cities. And really, the peasantry were also revolving around the production of the urban cities. It wasn't that the peasantry were like complete. They, you're right, they were uh, um, producing in a sort of a, I guess, less bourgeois sense. But really. You're saying they were still producing for exchange? They were all, not just that, but that they were produ- the, the city, the capital. This urban city was the the sort of the center of these bourgeois nations, and that really any any sort of cir- any circulation any any activity of the nation was in regards to these bourgeois cities, and that you know the, the, it's not like the peasantry were outside these bourgeois cities, right? I hope uh, if that clarifies things. Yeah. So this term bourgeois society, I agree, is is a weird term. It's it's a term that you know we don't often get and. It's often, I guess, disagreed upon. I think the way that I try to understand this notion of bourgeois society is really that it's it's an expression of, uh, as Hegel was saying, of of the rationality of society towards freedom, and that this was only expressed in these cities. That you know, before the sort of the urban cities, the nation wasn't necessarily, I guess. I don't want to say unified, but it was the the, the people weren't making demands of the government. They were making demands, but they were making they were making like political social demands of everything. That was the great actually. There was I think you know we often refer to as the first um, the what was it called the glorious revolution of England. Mm-hmm. You know that that I guess was a sort of a proto bourgeois revolution. It was a demand of the people for sort of freedom and political power. That was kind of the first. Instant in some sense, and it I developed I differently. Say, I would say it's the English Civil War instead, but, uh, but sure. like the broad point that, that I like, I yeah. Sure. But yeah, but like both processes, like they're both like they're mm. all like part of the like a lot of like the Civil Wars, like a lot of the stuff that got established by the Civil War, like just wasn't going to fly in like a properly formed like capitalist bourgeois society. Um, okay. It, it, it gets, like, it gets, and, and like and like England gets like overthrown by the forces of reaction, like in the form of like Charles II. Mm-hmm. But like, and then like there is like a liberalisation, and there's also like a drift towards like more formal standing armies, as opposed to like what was going under like Charles, like like more of like a centralisation of like state mm. power. Well, the problem of state power is a is a very uh, I- different question, but yes, it's definitely. A what, what what's your objection to like you, you you seem to multiple times sort of get um like object to the term like capitalist society or, mm-hmm. like, or yes what's, what's what's your objection the to object that understanding yes yeah I agree the objection is not that you know I'm saying that capitalism doesn't exist right it, it does like it, we're experiencing it really it, it only emerges as a, it, it it's to kind of equate what was happening um, in, in these sort of bourgeois societies with what was happening, in the, let's say just even let's say France of the 1980s with the France of let's just say the Germany or even let's just say France of the 1840s, really there's something particularly different about the nature of the crisis. So in France, the crisis was the crisis. It was that it was that the demands of the bourgeois demands were being made. 
to society. And this was based on the uh, abolition of the clergy, of the nobility, and of sort of these sort of feudal relations. Whereas, like the right to free property. Exchange, yes, sure. yes. So, yeah. That's why Locke is also a sort of a yeah. bourgeois philosopher. Whereas in the 1840s, the demands are, I mean, the, the, I guess there's a minutia of the nobility, perhaps, but maybe probably not. But the demands are sort of the demands that the previous demands were kind of lacking. That the, it's not lacking, sorry. That the demands of the 1840s were now for, you know, they were expressing better wages employment, full employment, um, better conditions. These demands were, the demands were different. And these demands expressed themselves in socialism. And, it, but, but still, it's not that socialism is just rejecting bourgeois society. Socialism is sort of, it, the, the demands the socialists are making are still bourgeois. So would you say we live in bourgeois society now? We live in bourgeois society in crisis. It's, it's surviving, but you know we're all thinking about when the next economic mark cra crisis is going to come. Like it's like the, the the thought of economic crisis is again not like a hiccup. It's part of the, it's part of the crisis of bourgeois of capitalism. What if we can just go on then? We can. Die. <laughs> <laughs> or something or a flood. What yeah. if what if Elon Musk manages to get off Earth and he can colonize? I mean that that's an yeah, but the thing is that you know it's bearable. You're right, but what I want to highlight is what Marx's radicalism and Hegel's radicalism is that you know we as free agents have the ability of an emancipatory politics of a society that isn't isn't like this. Like I would say, the society right now is very not it's it's durable. It's endurable, but like it could be better. It would be so much better, you know. There's so much suffering in the world that we could, and it's not just. A, this is not a moral question, by the way, that these demands for freedom, for equality, and for prosperity are really the demands any human would make of society. I mean, what else is bourgeois philosophy other than the demands of the individual? Why are people not making That's the crisis. That's why we're in a post-political era. Like, and this is actually we'll get. Um, I didn't highlight it as deeply. But the regression of Marxism, both in the Russian after the Russian Revolution, but also in the New Left and the post-political 90s and 90s Left, kind of left the people, just especially the Left, traumatized about what you know how Marxism kind of developed. We were yeah, just just a second that we were almost left, almost that you know a century of social revolution, and we're left with very little almost at our hands. Yes. So. You know, like, most people who, like, eat throughout history who, like, take to the streets and risk their lives, like, are not motivated by some abstract philosophy, like, do they, yeah. do they need Marxism to, like... That's another question, and this is actually a question, you know, we pose at Plasipus, really, is, um... um organizationalist versus spontaneous today. <laughs> Actually, Kor when, uh, I'll go back to Korsh, and when Korsh, he had this other quote that I didn't have, he was saying that if we are, if we are, if as Marxists we are to analyze history, we would really need to see how Marxism had developed and how Marxism had changed. And the task for Marxism today, I think, is precisely the same, is to understand how Marxism developed and how Marxism failed, and how this actually changed well, people. We don't know. That's a question. Like that seems like if you're gonna be like trying to change the world, that seems like. I mean, the, the thing is that I'm not trying to actively change the world. <laughs> okay, well, the, like you want to, right? Not, not necessarily. When we when we say we want for emancipatory politics, really, when we want to say we want that, we you just wanna. We're, we're trying to see that what how Marxism developed and how the left developed. But, like you want to do that so you can. Hopefully, at some point, if not yourself, someone else. The point is that understanding how history and the left and Marxism developed may help us. It may help it's us. Like with we should just, just. I really want to get this clear. Okay. We should want to change the world for the like. Yeah. Okay. That feels like a very baseline sure. thing that, like, of course. I, would, I kind of walk in here assuming 
Yeah, I mean, sure, of course everyone wants to change the world. The real question is how do you change the world? So maybe I, like, there's something personal in my, my goal is to change the world. Um, <laughs> I feel like a lot of, like, Marx and, like, his philosophy and, like, economics is, like, really instructive, not only in, like, the broad abstract, but also, like, there's a lot of, um, uh, like, very practical lessons that you can get out of it. Okay. Um, like, some of, like, like, um, like, the best, like, union organisers, for instance, in Australia have been people who are, like, very educated in, like, Marxism and, like, and, and they're from their understanding of, like, economics and uh, their basis in history, like, the, like, basing so the theory. Like yeah, yeah. How, how, wait I have great capitalists, personally, all three, because I'm not insane, but <laughs> like, there is nothing in there, at least, you know, my maybe superficial reading, that there is nothing in there that I'm like, oh, this will help me, you know, win, like, a better wage, or like... You're right, yeah. you're right, the, sure. the, the demands, the, the things that was written in Capital, well, and actually Adorno says this, that, you know, you could, you could, um, Really, Marx's political economy doesn't inform me at all how to act politically, and that's that's what. It's not great. No, precisely, and that's what. You need both. You need Lenin. Both. Lenin was the. Ex that's why, in some sense, Lenin was critiquing the Marxism of the Second International, and that ha in the in the way he takes on Marxism is to really put in Marxism's revolutionary political question on the line. His reading. So, so like, because I know about the history. So like yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you're trying to say that like social democrats who like went to jail and like worked all of their lives were like not revolutionary? Well, they're not. As no. I'm not saying that they're not revolutionary, but like a lot of them were making reformist demands. Sure, because of like, but like they were like, they were like, we are doing this. Yeah, that was. In, uh, yeah, I think you're right. They were was, like, they were registering they were, Marxism. They they were. Like, I've, I've read I've read like histories of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. They were like, we want a revolution. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, um, sorry, can I can I pause please. this to to return to? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just just before you do, um, um, I lost my train of thought. My bad. No, no, it's fine. Um. The, 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 um, what, what Korsh is trying to highlight is that the, the demands these were making was a rejection of all Marx's philosophical roots and the distinction between theory and practice. And that the, 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 the way they were, and like uh, there's this thing that the Second International puts on this theoretical Marxist thing, but in their practical activity, they weren't really understanding what Marxism meant. That, that what, so what, what, what does Marxism mean? That's the question. That's what that's what Platypus is about. So like, I mean, shouldn't we have like after two hundred? Like, so, like the Communist Manifesto right. is like top ten bestsellers of all time. Yes, it getting is getting close to the Bible. Ahead of I know. <laughs> Interesting. So like some of the greatest minds of the last century mm -hmm. have been Marxists. Yes. Like. How is it that so much intellectual effort has been put into this problem, mm -hmm. and you come here and you're like, we don't know what to do? Well, we don't know what to do. I mean, I mean, there's still, there's the, the, the crisis is still ongoing in some sense. That, uh, but like, I mean, you, you, like Einstein was a like Einstein was a fuck like that guy figured out relativity quite like that shit is hard. Yeah. All right, like. If those motherfuckers could, <laughs> what hope do we have? I mean, that, that's the question, really. And actually, the un, another title for the teaching is the original title is "Capital in History." Does Marxism even matter? Does Marxism even matter for the 21st century? So, so when when I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I'm presenting this, it's not that I'm trying to say that woohoo, we need Marxism, we need the correct understanding of Marxism today. Really, I'm trying to pose the problem what are we, of. What are we, like, how do we are like? What do we, do we, do we, like, should we just, like, I don't know, should we, like, cross out that Marxism <laughs> and just be, like, philosophy? Like, what, well, what, are, what are the steps forward to, like, do, do, do we even have a plan to formulate a plan? 
But like, I, I, I think like there's plenty of masters who have articulated how we get to revolution. No, 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 no. But, like this entire thing is like that's kind of bullshit. Like, like. Mm, no, I disagree. Uh, okay, I, great, yeah. cool. Like, you know. I'm actually gonna just, um, I just want to end this teaching, we'll, we'll still discuss, okay. you want to, to, to end the recording, great. so um, we can still discuss, um, so thanks everyone for coming, just uh, it's been a great teaching. Yeah. Uh. So,